Do you feel the power of love in this room? Well, I hope you do. Let's get it going. I've turned to someone to say, I love you. Turn to that person next to you and say, I love you. Uh Uh-huh. I love you. There's nothing wrong with good old spirit of love being shared amongst one another. Did everybody get an I love you over over here? Did you get an I love you? Someone say an I love you. Make sure that everybody gets that feeling. Randy in the sound booth, did you get an I love you? Oh, we love you. All right. All right. Barbara over there in the very end, did you get an I love you? Okay. Michael, did you get an I love you? Martha? All right. Everybody. Well, we want to make you capture that wonderful spirit of love because I, as your pastor, truly love you. And in that, it is my desire that I might give it to you straight and simple, help you along your journey of life, to help you most importantly with that spiritual life that you're living and helping it to be to the highest and best to the fullest. We've been proclaiming that we're going higher, going higher and higher in our spiritual life, going higher in the awareness, the consciousness, being more and more in tune with that which is of the spirit within our hearts and our lives. And as we do that, we do it together. But we want to do it today in a very straightforward and simple manner. I want to give it to you in the simple details that help you understand. So this is what it is. We're talking about the power of prayer in our lives. This is what it is. This is a wonderful uh, gift that we've been given, this wonderful aspect to be in communion with God. But quite often we are struggling and wanting to learn how do we pray? How do we really do it effectively? How do we really connect? So we struggle sometimes as we're always looking for the latest words or process. But let me tell you this, as we understand that the very first thing we need to know if we're going to go to prayer is to know the nature of God. Now, there's a lot of people who say, wait, 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 just teach me how to pray. Pastor, that's all I want to do. Let's cut to the quick. Let's jump to the, to, the, to the process right now. I just want to learn how to pray because I know the power of prayer and how it changes lives and can manifest the miraculous. Can I just learn how to pray? Okay. But first, let's first things be first, and that is we must know the nature of God. We must understand that which is all of God, that which we refer to as God. We must understand it for we know that what God is by God's character or God's nature. Now, you may have seen it unfolded through the stories of the Old Testament, and that can be kind of troubling because what we see there is a God of wrath and punishment or suggesting or calling and commanding people, go out and slay the thousands, go out and kill these, Uh, a God of wrath and judgment, God of punishment, We find the Old Testament sometimes troubling as we're looking to the character of God, especially in contrast with the very teachings of Jesus, where Jesus speaks of God as love, God as grace, God as forgiveness, God as compassion, God as all these wonderful attributes. And you were saying, wait a minute, how do I put this Old Testament with this New Testament? This seems like it would be very confusing there, but what we find is an evolution of people's consciousness or thinking the way they looked at God through the old coming to the new. So we don't throw away the old, we don't abandon it, but we learn from it and we see an evolution. How many of you would say my understanding of God when I was six years old is totally different than my understanding of God today. Oh, you've changed. Your six-year-old self might be your Old Testament, and today be your New Testament as an example of the growth and transition that you've changed. We don't throw away that which we understood when we were six years old. We learn from it. We build on it, don't we? And so it is, as we moved on, we learn from the old, as we move into the new, we understand that each one is an evolution of our spiritual understanding, and it's constantly trying to reveal to us the very nature of God, the character of God. Because when we understand that, we're going to know how to pray. Very simple. And you'll say, ah, so this is what it is. First of all, what we do want to understand is that there are so many examples of Jesus' teaching that are there that really bring us this wonderful power and clarity. Today you read that text, and it may sound a little bit confusing, it says, when Jesus came to the world, he said, I have heard that it was, you have heard that it was said this way, but I say unto you, it's this way. You see, what Jesus was doing was building on those wonderful truths, insights of the past, and helping them to see it with greater clarity. 
Oh, so many beautiful stories of the ancient truths of the Old Testament that were so powerful but needed to have new light shed on them so they might understand, what does this really mean for us? How do we really apply these things? Is it just law and rules and regulations? Or is there a spiritual insight for us that helps us to be who we're called to be? Oh, the great self-help book. The Bible unfolds through Jesus' great teaching. You may have heard it this way, but let me explain. I'm going to tell it to you this way. I'm going to shed some new light and bring some clarity on you. So that's why we find the Old Testament maybe projecting a sort of character that seems foreign to that which is of the New Testament. But we're understanding here that Jesus had this great experience with God. And this is the beautiful example for us. His experience with God, and he learned to pray and to commune and to be in oneness with God in such a way that there were great miracles that happened through him. Here's the problem. We begin to be people who just read about Jesus, learn about Jesus, when he says and invites us to do as he did. This is one of the great understandings that we have kind of uh, got clouded over, that Jesus was trying to say, I am here to reveal and to show you. I am the great example for your life. I am trying to show you this pathway for us. Uh, But our problem is the world hasn't always done as Jesus has laid out for us. We haven't always followed the very teaching and examples of Jesus. We've sort of gone on our own way and thinking, "Let's, let's read about Jesus. Let's study about Jesus but let's do Jesus is the real call for our hearts and our lives. So what we find is that Jesus began to teach us the very nature of God, help us to understand it. And the first part that I really want to review for you is that there is really something out there that's very powerful as Jesus spoke about in parables. He spoke for us in beautiful ways of stories that were simple, that the people of the day and age could grasp. And I hope they can be simple for us today, even though we're 2,000 years later in a different cultural setting. But here's the many ways that Jesus described the presence of God. When you're entering into the presence, when you're coming into it, referred to as the kingdom of God, the realm of God that it be very much so like a mustard seed, that when you receive it, it may be small, it may be something simple that you grasp, a a word of truth or a little bit of understanding, but planted in your heart and life, it grows and flourishes. And the mustard seed, small as it may be, grows into this great tree that a bird may rest upon in his example. People begin to say, oh, I understand that when we're talking about the presence of God, it may come to us in simple, small ways, but it would grow in our life and manifest within our life as our awareness and is heightened and it's changed and we begin to understand, ah, that's what you're talking about. Now we understand the presence of God at work within our lives. Jesus spoke about the presence of God being like a treasure. If it's lost, you would go and find it. He illustrated it as like a woman who has lost a coin and she just frantically wants to clean the house until she finds that lost coin. So it is that we too may be hungry, searching for the value of this wonderful presence of God in our own lives, that we are adamant saying, I need it, I want it, I must find it. I want it because it's going to be of great blessing to me. Jesus talked in parables that the kingdom of God, this presence of God is like soil. When seed is planted, some of it will fall on hard ground and you may not receive it completely. Some hearts and lives may be that which would reject it. But oh, when that seed falls into the wonderful soil of rich nurturing power and presence, that seed begins to expand and grow within our lives. He talked about the presence of God as leaven in example, sort of yeast that it causes things to transform and to rise, as we see in the example of yeast in bread. So it is that when the presence of God is within us, that we rise to our highest and best. We move, we are transformed, we are not the same as we were before. So consequently, you see the Old Testament one way, but as people begin to experience the presence of God in greater ways in their life, and each one of those stories is about people unfolding the presence of God in their life in new and greater ways leads us to this New Testament time of Jesus describing exactly the character, the richness, the elements of God that we want to understand within our hearts and our lives. For the realm of God is this indwelling, uh, us dwelling in God. 
How many of you have ever been on a cruise and maybe you picked up a brochure before that would tell you this is what you're about to expect? Uh, maybe you've done something like, or a vacation pamphlet, something from a resort, and you look through it and you go, oh, wow, I can expect a beautiful cabin, luxurious meals, wonderful destinations, a, a safe ship, all these wonderful things that may be available. Well, let me tell you this, the nature of God is like this cruise brochure. When you understand it, it tells you what you can expect. When you know the nature of God, you know what to expect. You know how then that you might pray in effective ways. You know how God works. And the first thing is that there's a real challenge because our basic understanding of the nature of God is one that, you know, has a lot of challenges in our world today and in our religious uh, dynamics and our churches today. Let me start with something that's kind of controversial, and that is the first, number one, it's a waste of your time to ask God for anything. Ooh, okay. It's a waste of your time to ask God for anything because God isn't withholding anything. So when you understand that, it's a waste of our time to ask God for stuff because God's ready to give. It's not withholding. So we believe that we need to ask because we believe that God is holding something back from us. We think that uh, we, there might be something that we need to beg or plead or ask or petition God to give us. When all along God is saying in the heart of generosity, it is my good pleasure to give you the kingdom, to give you every aspect of the presence of God, every aspect that's there for you. It's ready there for you. So why are you asking? The only reason you're asking is because you believe it's being withheld. Now people will say, wait a minute, doesn't scripture say ask and ye shall receive? And here's the trouble we have with understanding the word ask, for really that ask is a divine proclamation. It is being in the very power and presence of knowing God's not withholding anything. And so we don't need to go and ask in the sense of, Lord, please make it possible, would you please, uh, as if we need to ma manipulate or beg in some context. But simply we are there to affirm, declare, realize, and speak that which we desire in our hearts and our lives. Why do we know this? Because scripture tells us over and over again, it is God's good pleasure to give, to give, to give. Now, you may ask, you ask of someone who doesn't really know, right? Now, when you were little, you asked of your mother who didn't know you had need of something. You know, when you were that baby, you cried asking your mother to change your diaper because maybe she didn't realize that your diaper needed to be changed. When you were a little uh, older, you asked mother for something to eat because mother didn't realize you were hungry, right? Maybe you asked father to help you ride a bike because you didn't know how to ride a bike and you were trying to get that help and assistance because all these things the father didn't know you needed that help. So in our earthly context, yes, we're used to asking because we're asking of that which doesn't know. But don't we understand that God knows our need before we even ask. So if this is the divine principle that we're to live by and we know the nature of God, that God knows your thought but even before you thought it, that the whole, that all that is of the universe of intellect already knows the needs and desires of your heart before you even ask. So the ask is not would you please because God already is already ready and eager to meet it the ask is a declaration. It's a proclamation, a realization that simply says, I'm not asking, would you? I'm speaking now, this is what I claim. This is what I know. This is what I believe. And this is what I receive with the open heart. You know, sometimes we um, ask because we simply believe that things are withholding and you don't really want to give it. We ask for things that we believe are ours to claim uh, and the things that are freely given, but sometimes we withhold because we think, oh, maybe God doesn't really want to give it to us. You know, I play fetch with our dog Bailey and he's been taught to retrieve and bring it back. Ah, but so often he really doesn't want to give it up. That's the real thing. So he is out there getting it and he's we're playing the wonderful game, but you don't really want to let go of it, do you? You don't really want it. So it's like a tug of war and pulling it. Like, okay, so you're, you're going and getting it, and you're going to bring it to me, but you don't really want to let it go. And sometimes we think the same of God. I can ask of God. I can beg of God, but I just don't really think that God wants to do this for me. i got to tell you this. The Spirit of God loves you so much that God is already wanting your highest and best what is it you desire in your life? 
And I know a lot of us are struggling. We say, wait a minute, doesn't God have a special desire for us, our lives? If we were to only live by the desire that God had ordained, we would be puppets, wouldn't we? If God says, I already desired for you that you are going to live in outer Mongolia, and you, well, wait a minute, I don't want to live in outer Mongolia, but oh, you don't have a choice. This is my desire for you. Oh, then you need to be a puppet of mine, and I will tell you exactly what my desire is, and you must do that. The desires of the divine are your desires. So when we claim those desires, when we welcome those desires, now they're good and godly desires in the context that they have the highest and best, not only for ourselves, but for the world around us. God is there not withholding anything. So we want to understand that because quite often we have to look around the world. Is God withholding oxygen from anyone today? No, no. So why are we not praying? God, give us some oxygen. How many of you have ever prayed, Lord, give me some oxygen? You know, you know, every day you're breathing oxygen. Why? Because you already know the universe, all that is of God, is supplying oxygen for you. And so we don't pray for those things because we know that they're already given for us. Air and oxygen and life, the day or night. How many of we pray, God, give us day or God, give us night? We know that they're coming every 24 hours. It's in a cycle. We don't pray for those things because we know that they're already given for us. What if we moved on beyond that and began to say to ourselves, I just know that the goodness of God is there for me. I don't need to ask in the sense of I don't have or a belief that God is withholding. Instead, I proclaim that I know that all these things are coming for my good. So if we know, number one, the nature of God is not withholding anything from us. Secondly, We've got, got this idea that God may be very condemning or judgmental because we read a lot about God's judgments in context. But when Jesus came to the earth to preach and was bringing about this revelation of the understanding and the clarity of who and what God is, he came, you know, emphasizes over and over again the very character of God. I did not come to condemn. Wow. Jesus didn't come to condemn. Jesus revealing the very essence of God did not come in a spirit of condemnation. His very nature was that of love and forgiveness, empowering and seeing the highest and best. How many remember the story of the woman brought before the accusers, taken in, accused of adultery and going to be stoned? Do you remember? That? How long did it take Jesus to forgive that woman? Two days? No. Six hours? No. How about two seconds? You see, he spoke out instantly. Was there a moment of contemplation? Should I condemn or should I not condemn? Should I bring out fault or not bring out fault? There was no question for the very nature, the divine nature within Jesus that is teaching us by example is that forgiveness was freely given. Easy. How long did it take Jesus to forgive Peter who betrayed him? Did it take him a long time to say, I'm going to have some hard time getting over this. Let me think about it. I'm not so easy to really forgive or willing, ready. How about on the cross when he was with, well, between two thieves and he spoke to those who were his persecutors. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How long did it take him to form those words? They flew out of his mouth. Do you understand the very freedom that God is expounding in the sense of freely given for you is the power of forgiveness that there is no condemnation. If Jesus taught us we should forgive 70 times 7 and pray for our enemies, what do you think his God thought? Or the, the wonderful sense of divine within him. If Jesus is teaching this, he's speaking the revelation of God flowing through him. The condemnation is not there. It's not a world of guilt and shame and shame on you and you're bad and all this kind of stuff. It's a, a wonderful world of great forgiveness. If God knows the desires of our heart, knows what we need before we even ask, God already knows that forgiveness is there before you even really need to ask. This includes, until we know that the nature of God is purely good, we have to really understand that that's the way we come to God. Until we really understand that fully, we're always going to struggle in our prayer life that the goodness of God is there. Not the judgment, not the punishment, not the guilt, not the shame of God, but the goodness of God there. Imagine the response of those who hear Jesus teaching uh, that the God they've been worshiping as 
desires no sacrifices. He was bringing clarity there, trying to help them to say that God requires no sacrifices. And that was pretty controversial. You can imagine, it's the teachings of Jesus is why they crucified him, because he was constantly bringing out something for them, constantly trying to say, wait a minute, this is what we believe, that God always wants us to sacrifice. And we must sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice to appease a God who's angry. Jesus' words were, God finds no pleasure in your sacrifices. God finds the pleasure in the intentions of your heart, the expressions of that which is in, the, which is happening within your consciousness. Let me lastly say that as we understand the nature of God so we can pray effectively, is that we're not called to fear God. For fear indicates a lack of understanding of God. We say fear, but that text was offering us a respect respect for all the law and the spiritual rules and, shall we say, guidelines of, of, of the promises of God. Let's just bring some clarity to that. We understand that we're called to respect these wonderful promises that say what you sow, you reap. Respect those because be careful what you're sowing. You're going to reap it. That's what it's all about, but it's not about a fear of God. So when we understand this, that we have nothing to tell God, we, for God is everything there, how silly it is that we, can, we think that prayer is then all about something in a conversation where we're telling God all these things. We bring to you, this is what prayer is. A beautiful silence, a stillness, a time of meditation that you go within. We may think the fine art of prayer is eloquent words. We may think it is those kind of wonderful traditions of speaking beautifully orchestrated prayers with responses, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, as if God were out to punish us and we needed to beg for mercy. What does that tell us about the kind of God that we serve and our relationship? You see, when we realize that prayer is not really at all about us, telling anything to God because God already knows. It's really not about asking for anything for God because God already knows and is eager and ready to give. It begins to change everything. And we move from thinking of God as a God of limitation to God of now dwelling within of infinite possibilities within our life. And we understand this and the beautiful illustration, this is what prayer is, is then found in the Garden of Eden. Wow, we may not think of the Garden of Eden as an example of prayer because we think it's, well, that's how the world began. Wow, oh, it's the story of creation, isn't it? The creation of what? It's the creation of communion with God and connection with God. So when we look at the Garden of Eden, let's analyze this beautiful story and this gracious symbolism for our lives. For this is what prayer is. And you say, ah, so that's what it is. Jesus said, you may have heard it this way, but I say unto you, it's this way, offering insight. So this morning, I want to capture that same insight to say, you may have heard the Garden of Eden this way, but let me offer it to you this way, offering us great symbolism and insight into the power of what our prayer life is all about. What happens in the Garden of Eden? What do we see? The stories of Adam and Eve walking in the presence let me tell you, this is what prayer is all about. It's not about conversations with God or eloquent words. It's just being in the presence of God. What was so beautiful about the Garden of Eden is Adam and Eve walking, being in that divine presence, being in that place where all things were working together for good and knowing that's at such a powerful level. We do a, what we call a prayer treatment and in that prayer is treating us to get into the garden, okay? Because what are we doing? In prayer treatment, we're treating our doubt and our fears. We're treating all of those apprehensions, those questions, those wondering, those thoughts, all that's gotta be removed if you're going to enter into this divine presence. If you're coming into the kingdom of God, if you're coming into the realm of God, if you're coming into the, all that is the dwelling of, that you, shall we say, of divine presence, found within your own life. Well, what is it? That prayer treatment is first, we take a step of recognition. We recognize the divine power. Our big problem is we think there's a problem and we think life is a problem. 
And that's the problem. We think it's a problem. And if we stop and we recognize, wait a minute, this problem is not a problem. Because why? We recognize there's one power. There's one presence. It's all-knowing. It never leaves nor forsakes me. So what's the problem here? Right? There's no problem when we begin to recognize and we begin to treat that fear and doubt and questioning within our lives. We begin to speak it. First, I recognize first and foremost there's one power and that one power is the divine power of God. Everything else is the absence of that power. Evil only exists in the absence of good. Light is there and present. There is no darkness. But darkness exists in the absence of light. There's only one power, and that's the power of good, the power of God. When we recognize that, everything else is powerless. And we have to come to that place of recognition that moves us out of this fear, stress, anxiety, and uh, worry that capitalizes our life. And then we unify with that wonderful presence. We recognize it, and then we unite with it, don't we? We unite with this. That presence is flowing through me. That one power is flowing through me right now. That one power that knows all good is flowing through me right now. That one power that's never leaving me nor forsaking me is with me in this moment right now. And we're so unified with it, we become one with that divine presence. And fear, stress, worry goes away. And you have to ask then, what's the problem? And in that moment when there is no problem, you have the power to declare. Declare, this is what I see. All things are working together for good. I declare my healing. I declare my prosperity. I declare my blessing. For it is that which God desires to give to me freely, and I declare it. I declare it. I realize it. I embrace it, and I realize that this is mine right here and now. And then I move to a great gratitude and appreciation that says, the answer is already given. The answer is already there. I know it. I claim it. I live it. It's mine. I've spoken it. I realize it. And in that gratitude, then I release everything else. Worry, stress, fear. But I release that which I've spoken. And I release it to the universe, to all of God, all of this world to unfold. Because the Spirit has now said, Aha, I know Paula's desire. She just spoke it. I know what Norma wants. She just spoke it. I know what Richard's thinking and what he desires in his heart. He just spoke it. Now, if God knows the desires of your heart, right, and is waiting for you to make that declaration, because is your desire to go north or south, east or west? Which is it? Because all are available to you. Is it to go up or down, left or right? All are available to you. For God has made everything available to you. It's your freedom of choice. So God is waiting for you to express that desire. What is it you want, Frank? Oh, now I know. You're going north, not south. I had south ready, but you're going north. Okay. Uh, I had east ready, but west was going. Okay. You wanted to go up, and I was going to go down. You wanted to go left, and I was going to go right. Whatever the Spirit of God says, I was ready for any of those desires of your heart. You just had to realize them, declare them, speak them. And that's what we look at the word ask. It's not ask in a sense of, would you please? It's the power of declaration, already knowing that the loving God is already unfolding things for us. What else do we see in the garden but that they, there was complete rest in the garden? I love this. Because they, you'll find that everything that they needed was provided there. In the garden... Was there anything they need? Did they have any word? Oh, excuse me, I gotta leave the garden. I gotta go out and get something. I'm gonna run to the store and get something. I gotta go get, no, everything was right there in the garden, already there for them, right? And everything is right there when you enter in the divine presence of God. Everything you need, everything you need, strength, peace, grace, forgiveness, patience, love, joy, it's all there. You don't need to leave that presence to go out and get anything. It's right there. Stay in that wonderful presence. To walk in that presence, to rest in that presence, knowing it's all there. And then the beautiful thing was they had this wonderful gift that was given to them. The Spirit of God says, while you're in the garden and there's all these wonderful creations around, why don't you name them? And I love this because it's so symbolic for us. 
The power to name everything, to call it as you see it, to call out and name the experience is so beautiful because that's the gift God has given you. Name the experience you desire. I can't imagine, you know, that as they went through the garden, they were, I see elephant, I'll name this giraffe, I'll call this cow, I'll call this dog, I'll call this a mouse, you know. But they were naming what they were seeing and naming the experience, and this is the spiritual symbolism of this great lesson for your life is, what are you naming your journey? What are you naming? What are you calling your day-to-day -day experience? How are you naming it? Because that's the realization that the good is there for you when you name it. I name my today good. My, good, my day is full of blessing. My day is full of great uh, unfolding of infinite wisdom. I know that my day is full of God's love and grace and mercy. I, know, I name my day and I call it out forward. I name that this is exactly what I'll be experiencing. I call it out and how powerful that is for us in the journey of our prayer life, rest be in that presence. Be in the wonderful place where you name your experience. And lastly, get naked. I knew you'd like that one. <laughs> because in the presence is where you strip of all those barriers. You remove all those facades. You remove all of those things that may have been there that you think you need to look like or be... And you can be in that moment naked with no shame. I love this. Adam and Eve, naked. No shame whatsoever. Very proud of the birthday suit that they're in. Looking, feeling really good about it. And how about us having this spiritual nakedness that says, I have let go of every facade. I don't have to be something for God that, you know, I am not. For God knows who I already am. I love the experience of coming out for me as an LGBT person. You know, I had kind of dressed myself in things that I thought I needed to cover up who I was. Let me try to be straight. Let me put on some labels. Let me try to be something that I'm not. But then God might love me. Maybe God will accept me. Let me be put on piety and religion. And let me try to be really, uh, present myself that I am a, a really honest and good person uh, with no, uh, full of perfection and no faults. And yet sometimes I had to strip myself naked and say, I am not that. I'm none of this. I am who I am. And I could be naked with no shame before God and just say, this is who I am. And you love me. And that's the divine presence. This is what prayer is all about. It's not about eloquent, fancy words. It's all about simply coming into a divine presence. Be still and know. Know that I'm God. Be still and come into this garden of great peace. Be still and come into this place of Eden where communion was created where people commune and rest and find this wonderful sense of oneness. Well, what is the word to commune? To commune is to share, to be in oneness with one another. I commune with you, and when I do, I'm in oneness with, not in separation, not in division, not in, not, uh, in any way separate from one another, but united in this wonderful power and presence. This is what happens when we enter into our own Garden of Eden when we come into prayer, into the kingdom of God, into the presence, a place where nothing is withheld, a place where there's no condemnation, a place where it's all good, and good is waiting to be bestowed upon your life with great pleasure. This is the divine presence. So coming into prayer is to rest. And today I invite you to come into the Garden of Eden in prayer come into this place where you find meditation, the power of stillness, the power of quiet, and just resting because you know everything you need is already there. What more needs to be said? Ah, shh, don't say a thing. Nothing more needs to be said. Oh, oh, uh, but no, shh, hush. Nothing more needs to be said because it's all right there. It's right there. Your answer, your needs, the desires, they're all right there. You don't need to leave Eden. Rest there.
Stay there. Be there. Get naked. Amen.